So what's at the center of your life? What is most central? Maybe said another way is what do you value the most? What's the most important thing for you? My goal today before we leave is for each person to be able to honestly be able to answer that for their own lives. What's at the center? What's most important? My name is Trinity Davis. I get the honor of being one of the pastors here. Trinity Davis, five syllables. My friends call me TD because five syllables is way too much. Um, I am uh, honored to be able to preach to you today. Pastor David is on a much deserved uh, break and uh, getting some vacation time with his family. And today we're going to be looking at the book of Colossians. We'll get there in a minute. Each of you should have been able to have a handout given to you. There's a summer schedule on the back. And on the front side is simply a little illustration that we'll use today during the message. And I pray that that helps you stay focused as we work through that today. And if you're joining us online, thank you. Again, guest in the room, thank you. The most valuable thing you have is your time. So anytime you've chosen to be here with us, we, we honor and thank you for doing that today. So let's talk about priorities. I don't know if it was instilled in me, maybe from Boy Scouts or playing sports or maybe a high school teacher, somewhere along the way, maybe my parents, but you know, you have to get your priorities in order. Everybody, you gotta get your, you know, priorities are important. And so we typically do this list here of priorities. You know, as a Christian, we would say, well, you know, God, Jesus, you know, Christ is most important. So we wanna put that at the top. Um, you know, Jesus is first. And then we would say, well, maybe our family is next. And if you're married, then, you know, your spouse, obviously, it's a super important relationship. And then if you have children, right? So that's my priority. It's my God and then my family. And we'd go down and say, you know, work. I mean, many of us will spend more time on a job than we will with our family at home. And so, you know, work is important. And maybe if you're a student, that doesn't apply to you for this season. Maybe it's school. You know, you've got a whole set of relationships you deal with at school. You go down to church. You come and be a part of a local body and serve God in some capacity. You've got friends, right? Your social life, the people that you hang with, those are important. Some of us have lifelong friends or new friends in our life. We've got hobbies. I mean, some, you know, we're like, hey, I, I just want to enjoy some of this. I need a hobby. I need something I can do. I always feel like I'm keyed up or on, so I need a balance. So we've got hobbies. And then, you know, money's important. You've got to pay for all of it. Um, <laughs> so we've got this list of things, and we say that these are our priorities but the trouble with just a list like this is it doesn't show how these things relate to each other. Most importantly, it doesn't show what it means to have something central or most important in our life. Because the truth is, not everything can be a priority. It's true there's only one priority. Um, I think it's true that uh, the Americans added the S onto priorities, priorities, because the definition of priority is a oneness one thing at the center. And so this diagram, one, the one you have in front of you today, I think is more helpful because what it demonstrates is that whatever is central affects all the other parts. Whatever is at the center will have an implication for all the other things. It shows that having a priority is important and how that centralness affects all these other things. And that's what we're gonna look at today. One uh, really cool story, I think it's a funny story that helps relate to what's at the center affects everything else, is I'm gonna take everybody back to their uh, grade school or high school cafeteria. Now, I know you may have gone to a school, you had a really nice cafeteria, and the food was excellent and nutritious. I did not. I'm a very picky eater, and the cafeteria that I attended in, in grammar, I say grammar school, elementary school and high school, I'm still recovering from the trauma of some of the dishes that were served. Um, but even better than stories that I could tell, uh, some of you know Robert St. John is a chef and a, a local restaurant owner, but he's a great author too. And he can tie food, stories about food to our past. And so he tells this great story about being a fourth grader at Tim's Elementary School in the early 70s. And so what happened is I can imagine these boys sitting there one day, they noticed that every day at the end of, of, of their lunchtime, they would return their tray. And when they would return their tray, there was a, a lunch lady that would take her hand and remove the roll if it hadn't been eaten or touched and put it in a basket. 
every day at lunch, removed their tray, the, the roll was taken and put in a basket. And Robert said, the boys like, what are they doing with these rolls? I can't figure this out. You know, they started saying, I think they're probably taking them home. Uh, someone suggested, you know, maybe they're going to feed them to their family. So Robert said one of his first culinary creations was that he took his spoon and hollowed out a center in the middle of that roll and took his spoon and filled it with English peas. He took his fingers and sealed the roll and returned it back, put it on the tray, and as he returned it to the lunchroom, sure enough, the lunch lady reached in, grabbed the roll, and it went in the basket. So the next day at school, the boys were suspicious to try to figure out what happened to what he called the pea roll, when from across the lunchroom, there was a shriek, and a young boy had found it, he had bitten into it. So apparently it was customary in the 70s and 80s to reuse the food, right? Not sure that goes on today. If you work in the lunchroom, I'm sorry. I'm just telling the story that Robert told. But as silly as that story is, think about it. What was at the center affected everything else, right? What was at the center changed that. And so it is with our lives. Whatever is central in our lives will be most important to us and affect all the other areas. So today I want us to look in the book of Colossians. If you have your Bible, you can follow along. Um, I will have some scripture on the screen, but I wanna move through the book of Colossians rather quickly. But to do that, there's a few things that's very important that I set up. First of all, let's go over just an arc and overview of the gospel message itself. The God that loved us and thought of us from eternity past created humanity in his own image. And those image bearers, our first parents, Adam and Eve, they rebelled, they were tempted by a fallen being and they rebelled against God's perfect plan for them. And since those first parents, the Bible says that all of us in this room, everyone in the world is born dead spiritually. We are not alive spiritually. We may meditate, we may do uh, different new age practices, but we are dead, the Bible says, dead spiritually. But God had a plan from the beginning, and the, the beginning was to send Jesus, to send himself to become man and to come and to pay for that sin debt. And the way he did that is redeeming us first through a group of people, the nation of Israel. He chose a people, and through that people, he would send Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah. Jesus comes, he lives a sinless, faultless life, and he is crucified as a substitute for my sin and your sin. He didn't just lay in the grave. He was resurrected on the third day. He appeared to hundreds of people. He ascended into heaven and promised those who were there that he would come back one day. This is the synopsis of the gospel. Well, all of these Jewish people who had followed the God of the Old Testament for years, when they heard the message that Jesus was resurrected and they talked to eyewitnesses, they dropped hundreds and thousands of years of Jew Jewish religion and began to follow Jesus as the Messiah. And so not everybody was into that. A lot of the Jewish people did not like this new religion. If you mess with a man's religion, he takes it personally. And so there was active persecution of the early believers. Uh, many of them died going to their death saying, we had seen Jesus alive again from the dead and we're basing our faith on what they said, what they believed. And so one of the guys that didn't like what was happening was a guy named Saul of Tarsus, who was later renamed Paul. It's the guy that's the apostle Paul. He was persecuting the church. He was going places, seeing, overseeing the fact that Christians were in jail, that Christians were being executed. He was against the church. And one day on one of his visits to persecute more Christians, Jesus had had enough. And Jesus shows up on this road to Damascus he literally physically blinds Paul with a light and he says, Paul, not why are you messing with uh, me, my church, not why are you messing with my people? He says, Paul, why are you persecuting me? You see, anytime you mess with the church, Jesus takes it personally. And Paul's life was transformed. He, he had to go have his sight restored. He went into the desert. He sought the Lord. And the man who once persecuted the church became the greatest evangelist that we find in our New Testament Bibles. God used Paul to write most of these New Testament books that we read. And so Paul, quote, got a taste of his own medicine when Paul was caught and imprisoned. And while he was in prison, he wrote several books in our Bible. God inspired him to write. They're called the prison epistles. We find them in the New Testament. 
Um, there's a map here that just simply shows when Paul was on a missionary journey, he left Antioch, which is modern day Syria, and he began to travel all over the known world by ship to spread the gospel. He was eventually imprisoned. And some of these places that he was not able to make physically, he was able to go through letters. He wrote letters. And so these are the prison epistles, Philippians to the church at Philippi, Colossians to the church at Colossae, uh, F, the t- church at Ephesus. He wrote the book of Ephesians. You find these. So anytime you're in jail, God seems to use men that who are in jail to write great letters. And he did this. And these are part of our scripture. And so this is important. I want to paint this picture because it, it, setting the table is important for us today as we look through this. Two other important matters about the Apostle Paul and how he wrote. He wrote the first part of these books. Most of you, you see the book of Romans, Galatians, other books that he wrote. He would spend the first half of those books talking about theology, right? The first part's theology. Think about this, how to think about God, how to process who God is, his character, what God has said and done in the first half of the books, like the book of Colossians, first two chapters, The last two chapters, the last half is practice. How should we live now? What should we do? Now, this is a confession of a guy who's taught the Bible for a while and loves the scripture. A lot of our New Testament, a lot of our Christian literature and Bible studies are written primarily on the second half of these books because they're very practical. They're very, how do you, how should you engage in relationships? How do I work through forgiveness? Uh, What should I do with my children? Uh, I've got a tough situation, you know, and it's, they're very practical. Paul gets into, here's how you should live. But I would tell you, unless you rightly understand God, and we rightly understand the first parts of these books on how to think about God, we will not be rightly informed when it gets into the practice. Many people think that Christianity is another religions of how do this, do this, and don't do this. And that's probably been prolific because a lot of what we taught are these second halves. Here's the practical part. But the first part or maybe the most important part. If I were to write you a letter today and I, sh- I sent you an email and it was several pages and you just went and read that last part, you may go like, I don't, this doesn't make a lot of sense. And so it would be important to start at the beginning. And so today it's a challenge I'll be honest with you because I want us to talk about theology. I want us to talk about how we see God and how we see God seeing us. What is true? Some people say, well, that's just what God thinks. Well, let me tell you what God thinks is ultimate reality, not what you think and what I think or what someone feels in the moment. What is real is what God thinks and sees. And so it's important for us to start out and talk about theology. One more thing. Um, There were issues at many of these churches. Paul is writing the letter to the book, uh, to the the church at Colossae. He's writing Colossians because there were problems. There were issues in the church. Um, There have always been issues at the church. I think I had a very idealistic view of the church and, you know, people get disillusioned and there's problems or these people. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of been there from the beginning. There's always been issues The question is not, are there issues in the church or issues in your life or issues at your work or issues within your family? Yes. Let me answer it for all of us. Yes, there are issues. The answer is how healthy are we in navigating those issues? As we sang earlier, the rains came and the winds blew. That's a part of life. They're coming for all of us. Um, And so how well we're able to navigate those challenges. And Paul is writing Colossians to react to what's happened in the church. And so there's some, some teachings had infiltrated the church that had moved them away from a simple trust and faith in Jesus. It was becoming overly complicated. Some were saying there's special knowledge and mysteries and, and all of these things. And people were like, I, I just, I thought it was believing on the resurrected Christ. And Paul was like, yes, it is. And so he was calling while he couldn't go physically. He was writing this letter to confront them in this. So Let's look at this passage in Colossians. I'm just going to hit some verses. And then when we finally get to Colossians chapter three, I want that to be the focus of our final time here together today. So here's a few verses as I kind of preach through these and talk through getting a feel for this book that God was using Paul to write. First of all, as he always did, Paul starts out chapter one, verse one with a greeting and a prayer and just an acknowledgement an introduction. Then in verses 13 and 14, he starts to write 
about the centeredness of God and Christ over all things. He starts out with this. It says, for he, speaking of God, has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. Some translation says he has transferred us. I don't know about you, but my kids' account are tied to my banking account and I transfer money. And if I go in and I transfer money from my account, guess what? It's no longer in my account. It's in their account. It removes it, right? Church family, Christians, you have been transferred, past tense, you have been transferred from darkness into the kingdom of the Son of God. It has already happened. You are now children of light. You have been transferred. This is what Paul wants us to know. Then in verse 15, he turns his pen toward the centralness of Jesus in creation and that Jesus being more than a man, being divine. He writes this, he, speaking of Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. Look at that. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. Jesus just isn't before time. Jesus isn't just after time. Jesus is outside of time. There has never been a time that Jesus did not exist. There will never be a time where Jesus will not exist. He is the eternal God. He always has been. He always will be. And there was a time where he took on flesh and came to us. We call that a the incarnation, we celebrated at Christmas, but Jesus is eternal and he was there in the beginning when all that was made that we see and we cannot see was made. Jesus is God. And just like our sun right now, S-U-N, is at the middle of our solar system and everything orbits around and keeps its perfect place with the sun at the center. So when the sun, S-O-N of God, is at the center of our church and the center of our lives, everything takes its proper place in orbit. It's all held together. We were meant to have Jesus at the center of it all, especially our hearts. Paul goes on. And reads in this next verse, it says this in verse six. So then, just as you receive Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. Think about this. How did the church at Colossae, how did they receive Christ? How did that first church receive Christ? Paul says, just as you received him, continue in him, continue to live in him. How did they receive him? Not all of these people, probably most of them, had not physically seen the risen Jesus. They, they came to faith in him and received him by faith. They believed the message of the gospel. They trusted in what was heard. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of God. We believe what is preached based on the truth of God's word and in believing we are saved. And if you've done that in your life and you've believed on the Lord Jesus for salvation, that is how you are to continue. You continue in your belief. You started out by faith and you will finish by faith. It's a faith from beginning to end. The righteous, the Bible says, will live by faith. We are to believe truth. This is so countercultural. It's different than every other created religion that man has made that by faith, not by works, not by anything you do in and of yourself, but by trusting a message that your life would be transformed and changed. And so it is with the good news. They received him by faith. We received him by faith. They continued by believing. And the way we continue is by believing. Having been, look, look at this next verse. And this, this is where things start to change. This is where I'm gonna ask now just publicly for the Holy Spirit to help me and to help you grasp because I'm going to say words and I'm going to keep teaching. But the biblical truth here, and this is why the theology part is often skipped over because I'm going to say some things that are very important, but sometimes in our flesh and our temporalness, we don't get what's being put down here, what Paul is saying. And it's so important because there's a switch where Paul is going to communicate some things that, that are essential to us moving forward Two twelve. Look at this having been buried with him in baptism, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through our faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead, having been buried with him, having been raised with him, with him, 
with him. You see, salvation just isn't a matter of God forgiving your sins and giving you a ticket to heaven when you die. Salvation is about your life being identified with Jesus Christ. Salvation is about identification or union or that we are connected with God. It's not that Jesus died for us. Now we've got to go out and do the best we can to try to reflect that. No, God is in union with us. We say it every week. You saw it in the baptism today, buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. That is a symbol of something that really, really, really happened to Trey and to me and to others that believe that when Christ was crucified, that I was in him. You were in him, the Bible uses the phrase. It's not that it was for my behalf, it was a substitute, but we were in him. And when he was in the grave, we were in him. And when Jesus rose, we rose with him. Paul is pleading with us, and you'll see it in, as we make the transition, Colossians 3, to think like this. These are true of you if you profess Christ, if you've called on him. You are united with him. Nobody said it better than A.W. Tozer in this quote that I've got. And A.W. Tozer did not write the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Uh, he did write some theology that kind of gets up in our face. And uh, this, uh, if, you, if you're a theological person, this is, a, this is a, a challenge for you. And I want to put this out there. Many, look at this quote from A.W. Tozer. Many have emphasized the utility of the cross rather than the beauty of the one who died on it. The work of Christ has been stressed until it has eclipsed the person of Christ. Substitution has been allowed to supersede identification, and that's the word I'm using. What he did for us seems to be that more important than what he did to us. Paul wants us to know today that we have been in union with Christ and we are identified with him. When God sees us, he sees us united with Christ. Christ just didn't die for us. We died with him. We were raised with him. Think about these things as we approach this, because in Colossians chapter three, where we're going to spend the rest of our time, Paul immediately gets back on this identification train, not for, but with. Look at these first verses. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. I want to stop there. You have been raised with Christ. So today at lunch, you strike up a conversation with a person that's a non-believer and you say, you know, um, you're trying to maybe share your faith and you say, the Bible teaches that we're all born dead and spiritually dead. And they were go like, oh, that's really fascinating. That's, you, Christians are interesting. Y'all have an interesting faith. And they say, well, I don't really believe that. Um, you know, I, I think that we're all born spiritual beings. And you would rightly tell them, you'd like, I understand that's how you feel, but I'm basing what I believe on, on truth outside of myself. I'm basing it on the scripture. Your feelings really doesn't matter when it comes to truth. What is truth is true regardless of how we feel, right? And fellow believer, let me tell you this. You are raised this morning regardless of how you feel. You're like, I'm depressed, I'm down, I'm struggling. You are raised with Christ. You have been raised with him. It goes on to say this in the verse. Since you've been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. For you died, past tense, you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. You're dead, and you're alive, church. You're dead, and you're alive. You're dead to sin, you're dead to self, and you're alive to Christ. You cannot build your Christian life on your old self. You cannot add your spiritual disciplines and habits to your old self. You cannot improve flesh. We cannot improve flesh. Church is not a flesh improvement process. It is about a new identity, a new nature, and building on this new life that we now have in Christ. Here's the joy of letting you know that you're dead, letting you know that you're dead to self. By taking yourself out of the center, by removing yourself, it is such a relief to have to be in control of everything in your life. It is such a control to be able to remove self out of the center and to be able to enjoy the life as God has given you because God made you and God made me to have a God, to have a creator, to follow that creator. And when self is at the center, anxiety, depression, frustration, 
And we're so frustrated and angry because what we want, the control we desire, doesn't come to pass. And it's such a joy to know I'm dead. I don't have to live for me anymore. Man, it's such a relief. And it's a message I think we need in our day. Not only are we dead to self, there's one other thing it says here I wanna bring our attention to. Look Look at it saying, focus on the importance of setting your hearts and minds on things above. It says set your heart, and then later it says set your mind on things above. The heart and the mind are center. They are central to everything that matters in your life, what you process. Set your heart and mind on things above. The Amplified Version says this, set your mind and keep focused habitually on the things that are above, the heavenly eternal things, not on the things that are of earth, which have temporary value. There's no doubt Paul here is echoing Jesus' instructions to seek first the kingdom of God. Um, Thinking about forever. Um, We, I would encourage you, whatever your age is, if you're a young person, the the further you look down the road when you make a decision, the wiser that that is. So, you know, it's one thing to say, hey, I want to buy, you know, I want to buy this car today and, you know, I'm going to need to finance it. But the question to you is, if you think about the next five or six years, is that a wise decision for you based on what you need to do or what you're trying to accomplish, your finances? Um, we do well with money. Um, it's, we kind we kind of lose sight of this, this idea of compound interest. You could take a hundred dollars and you could, you could put it in an account a hundred dollars every month from the time you're 20 to 65, getting a decent return on your money. It's $870,000, right? A hundred dollars a month. Look how much wisdom is in that, right? We're, we're okay with that. But what we're not good with is what about an investment from a thousand years from now? What about an investment from 10,000 years from now? Shouldn't we plant things that come up? And the reason we don't is we think this is temporary. We think, I gotta get all I can right now. But the truth is we're eternal beings and Paul is pleading with us to set our minds on things above our hearts. What's at the center is Christ, to set our hearts and minds on things above. So if you're like me, there's only two Two times that I start sitting my, sitting my heart on things above, and this is, these are the two times typically. It's when somebody I love gets really, really sick or when somebody I know or love passes from this life. Those are the two times that I stop and as a culture that we stop to go, wait just a minute, this doesn't go on forever. What's most important here? You see, the story about Robert St. John and the P-roll, the kid that found the P-roll that day that bit into the English peas was a guy named Mark Weldy. And Mark and I were great friends. Mark, um, Mark grew up in Hattiesburg. He went to Southern Miss, played baseball, got a job. He worked for Mississippi Power for 30 years, and that's how I met Mark. And uh, he was older than me by you know, four or five years. His kids were older, so he was an older brother. I would go to his office and sit down and say, Hey man, how do you, this stage of your, you know, your life or your marriage or your kids, how do you manage these things? So he was, he was always a great uh, big brother to me, but in December of 2014, after some really weird health um, symptoms, Mark had been getting some tests run and he called me in December of 2014 and said, hey TD, it's, it's ALS. I, I have Lou Gehrig's disease. And um, His wife, Gail, is here today. She gave me permission to be able to share Mark's story. And from December until July the 26th of 2015, when the Lord took Mark home, it was a very rapid decline physically. It was a very rapid decline. And I would go sit with Mark and just to give him some company. And Gail was just, did so well at caring for him. And she would leave the room sometime just to give us time. And I said, Mark, what's God teaching you? And he, this is my paraphrase, two things, two things. What's God teaching you, Mark? The control I thought I had was an illusion and the eternal things are all that really matter. The control I thought I had was an illusion and all that really matters in the end are the eternal things. Paul is pleading with us, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. And look at this last verse. Because when, when Christ, who is your life, appears, 
you will appear with him in glory. Christ as our life. Christ does not merely give life, he is life. Paul said this, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live now, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Paul says in Philippians, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. The reality is Jesus is just not some segment of our life. Jesus is to be our life. Jesus, when Christ who is our life, when Christ who is our life appears, we will appear with him in glory. So my question is this morning, what's at the center? What's at the center of your life? We just take Christ out of the center and we look at a blank, empty space this morning. Only you can answer this. I can't answer this for you. Only you can answer this. But what is central? What is the most important thing in your life? I think for many of us, we started off like traded today or at some point in our life where we gave our hearts and we said, Jesus, I want your lordship. Be central in my life. Be centered to everything else in my life. And over time, he can drift out. We allow him to drift. And when he drifts and becomes a segment, guess what takes his place? One of these things. One of these things. One of these really great things becomes central. Family becomes central. Hobbies become central. Money becomes central. Work becomes central. Friends become central. It becomes the most important thing. And Jesus just remains on the peripheral as one of the things. We've all been there, I've been there, and in preparing for this message today, I had to return him back to his place at the center of my heart, right? But for some of you, he's never been central. You only added him to one of these slots. And maybe that's the way it all starts, but my concern is some people who have added Jesus to their life do not know him. He's simply an area of their life that they use to control the other areas, that they use to keep self at the center, to be self-ruled, self-demanded, self. When we have this scripture where Paul is saying, when Jesus, who is your life, when he appears, you will appear with him. So today we're gonna end a little bit differently I've given you this diagram to fill these in, to decide these other areas in your life, what's there. But the question now in the next few minutes that you can ask, answer quietly to yourself is simply what's at the center? What's most important to me? So Rob's gonna come out. I'm gonna ask everyone simply to stay seated and in their seats to bow their heads. And I just simply want you to talk with the Lord. I want you to commune with him. He's not angry with you, he loves you. And if you've allowed something else to become central, just ask the Lord back in. He'll graciously come back into that spot. And when Rob is finishing and the worship team's finishing singing over you, I'll come back out to dismiss. So just spend these next few minutes in prayer talking to the Lord about what is central in your life.